To listen to Killer Psyche ad-free right now, join Wondery Plus by starting your free trial in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. The expression, the eyes are the window to the soul, has been around a long time. In fact, so long that the question of who coined the phrase is debatable. For years, the eyes have certainly inspired artists who use them more than any other body part to opine about love and life. In Sophocles' version of the play Oedipus Rex, the eyes take on the meaning of truth, For those of you unfamiliar with this tale, Oedipus unknowingly kills his father and marries his mother, even fathering children with her. He learns the truth from a blind prophet. Oedipus then gouges out his eyes, proclaiming, Why should I have eyes? Why, when nothing I saw was worth seeing? He would rather have been blind than to see the reality of his life. In 1876, a physiologist discovered a pigment hiding in the back of the eye that would bleach in the light and recover in the dark. Today, it is known as rhodopsin, but back then, they called the retinal pigment visual purple. Another physiologist named Wilhelm Kuhn created a process that fixed the bleach rhodopsin in the eye and developed an image from the result called optograms. He believed he could capture the retina's last images. Kuhn tested his theory on animals, strapping the animal in place to look at an object. After three minutes, he would kill the animal and look at the eyes to see if they still had an image of the last thing the poor creature saw before it died. This was not only cruel, it was utter nonsense. But for decades, newspapers carried stories of people who claimed to use this technique to actually solve crimes. It became the linchpin of many crime novels. Even French novelist Jules Verne used it as the crime-solving method in his book, The Brothers Kip. Most serial killers take a trophy from their victim or a memento to remember their kill. Charles Albright took his victim's eyes. But why? Was he punishing them? Maybe stealing their soul or protecting himself? Or maybe he wanted to see himself as they saw him in the last moments before he took their lives. From Wondery and Tree Fort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Charles Albright, the eyeball killer. In the 1990s, crime rates had hit an all-time high in Dallas, Texas, and it was named one of the most dangerous cities in America, with police recording almost two homicides a day. In the early morning hours of December 13, 1990, 33-year-old Mary Pratt became Dallas's latest homicide victim. Mary's battered body 
was found in a residential yard in the North Oak Cliff neighborhood. She had been killed by a single 44 caliber bullet shot at close range to the back of her head. She was nude except for a bra and t-shirt pushed up around her neck and her corpse had been arranged in a vulgar pose. The sight of her exposed body was so disturbing that the neighborhood resident who found her felt compelled to cover her up with the bedsheet before the police arrived. Statistically, homicide detectives know that dumped body cases, meaning the victim's body was dumped in a location different from where they were killed, are rarely solved. And Mary's murder seemed likely to follow that pattern. There were no weapons or clues at the scene, no witnesses and no suspects. Dallas homicide detectives could only guess that she may have known her killer because of the close, intimate nature of the shooting. Given that Mary was a sex worker with a large clientele and her main job was to be intimate, detectives were not confident her murder would ever be solved. However, the Dallas medical examiner made a startling discovery during Mary Pratt's autopsy. She opened one eyelid to note her eye color and saw that the entire eyeball was missing. At first, the ME thought the bullet had dislodged it from the socket, but when she moved to the other eye, she was shocked to discover the second eyeball was missing as well. Both had been so carefully removed that no damage was done to the surrounding tissue and skin. Because the skin around the eyes is extremely delicate, The ME knew whoever did this had surgical skills, or they had a lot of practice doing it. After Mary's body was discovered, two officers on their regular beat encountered a sex worker named Veronica Rodriguez. She had large gashes on her head and neck, and her clothes and hair were wet and covered with mud. Veronica was a drug addict who was often incoherent and a known fabricator of wild tales. So when she told the officers she had been with Mary on a double trick together and witnessed her murder, the officers weren't sure whether to believe her. Veronica described the attacker as a middle-aged white male. She recounted how she escaped, running barefoot and partially clothed, through muddy fields. She ran to a nearby house where the occupant let her in and allowed her to hide. One week later, the same two officers found Veronica in the cab of a truck with its driver, Axton Schindler. She protested when the officers arrested Schindler, claiming he was the person whose house she ran to the night she was attacked. Veronica said that Schindler, also known as Speedy for his manner of speaking rapidly, knew who the attacker was. But Schindler refused to identify Veronica's attacker to the police, saying she was mistaken and the man she referred to was not dangerous. The officers took down Axton Schindler's name and address and made a report. Unsure of its significance, they passed the information on to homicide detectives. On February 10, 1991, the body of Susan Beth Peterson, age 27, was found dumped just outside Dallas city limits. She was shot three times in the back of the head and the stomach. When they discovered her eyes were carefully cut out, police began to suspect there was a new serial killer in town. On the morning of March 13, 1991, the body of Shirley Williams, 45, a black sex worker, was found on a residential street half a block from an elementary school. The killer wanted people to see what he had done. Like the two other women, his third victim was shot in the back of the head and her eyes were removed. However, this time, the killer damaged the skin around the eyes. 
the cuts were much less precise. At her autopsy, the medical examiner could tell the surgery had been hurried. The broken tip of an exacto blade was found embedded in the skin near her right eye. The police were worried that the media around the case drove the killer to leave his normal hunting grounds and move to a different area of the city. Shirley Williams worked out of a hotel a few miles from where the murderer's other victims were discovered. Additionally, this victim was black. Most serial killers usually choose victims from their same race. The killer was widening his circle of violence on women. The officers soon caught a break when another sex worker told them about how she recently maced a customer who tried to kill her. She described the man as, in his 50s, white with salt and pepper hair, driving a battered brown station wagon. She reported that her customer got angry when she refused to conduct business anywhere but a hotel. He grabbed her forcefully and screamed, I hate whores. I'm going to kill all you motherfucking whores. Then she maced him and jumped from his moving car. This woman's story prompted the officers to revisit the report of Veronica Rodriguez, the sex worker that police thought lied about her encounter the previous December. With the help of a Dallas County deputy, the officers were able to get more detailed property records. They discovered the guy who rescued Veronica was associated with two addresses. Due to his paranoia about the government, he had told police he lived at 1035 El Dorado Street and not a rented house where he actually lived. The officers learned that both properties were owned by a man named Fred Albright. However, Fred Albright was deceased, so obviously he was not the murderer. Incredibly, the same deputy that was helping the officers locate the property records had recently heard the name Albright in relation to these murders. He had taken a phone call from an anonymous woman who claimed to be a friend of the first victim, Mary Pratt. The woman said Pratt had introduced her to a man she briefly dated named Charles Albright. She claimed that Albright had a fascination with eyes and he had a collection of exacto blades in his home. The officers pulled Charles Albright's criminal record and his mugshots. They quickly realized that Charles was Fred's son and had inherited the two properties they were investigating. Then they contacted the homicide detective in charge of the investigation, believing they now had their killer. The fourth victim, Brenda, picked Charles Albright's face out in a photo lineup and said he was her attacker. A little later, they showed the same lineup to Veronica Rodriguez, the drug-addled prostitute who had told the officers that she was with Mary when Mary was killed. She was terrified, but she also identified Charles Albright as the man who had attempted to kill her. On March 22, 1991, at 2.30 a.m., police burst through the door at 1035 El Dorado Street, rousting Charles Albright and his common-law wife, Dixie Allen, from their sleep. Charles was handcuffed and taken to police headquarters. He was charged with the attempted murder of Veronica Rodriguez and held on $250,000 bail. Police searched Albright's main home six times. They collected dozens of exacto blades, books on serial killers, as well as the textbook Grey's Anatomy into evidence. The FBI also brought in a high-tech machine known as ground-penetrating radar that could see through concrete and solid walls. Behind a living room mantle that Charles had custom built, they found a compartment filled with pistols and rifles, but none of them were the weapon that had killed three murder victims. Although the police found that Charles had many animal body parts in jars, 
including eyeballs. They never uncovered any eyes that belonged to humans. In spite of the lack of physical evidence, three days after his arrest, prosecutors filed charges against Charles Albright for capital murder. When it comes to personal hygiene, who has time to read that long list of ingredients on the back of the bottle? Some ingredients I can't even pronounce. If you're like me and care about what goes on your body, then it's time to try Native personal care products like I did. I've been using Native's deodorant. My favorite scent is their coconut and vanilla, and I love that it's aluminum-free. In fact, Native keeps their ingredients list incredibly simple with things like coconut oil, shea butter, and baking soda. Some of their scents include lavender and rose and cucumber and mint. And they've recently partnered with Baked by Melissa to create a collection of scents inspired by her delicious cupcake creations. From tie-dye vanilla cupcake, mint cookie cupcake, fresh peach cupcake, to ginger lemonade cupcake, they are sure to make your day a little sweeter. Smell and feel fresh all day long with Native. Get 20% off your first order by going to nativedeo.com slash psyche or use promo code psyche at checkout. That's nativedeo.com slash psyche or use promo code psyche at checkout for 20% off your very first order. Podcast producers wear a lot of hats, and my producer, Julie, is no exception. If there's something that needs to get done, she figures out a way to do it. At this point, there's really not much she can't do. Except maybe speak another language, but she's working on that right now with Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. You see, for a long time, Julie has wanted to learn Italian. What she loves about Babbel is that it's fun, fast, and easy because they teach bite-sized language lessons for real-world use. If she can find 15 minutes, she's got time for a lesson. So a drive around town running errands or taking a short walk can really be productive. With Babbel, in addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Be like Julie. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code PSYCHE. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com code PSYCHE. Babbel, language for life. Charles Albright was born in Amarillo, Texas on August 10, 1933. His birth mother was very young and put her baby boy up for adoption. At three weeks old, Charles was adopted from the orphanage by Dell and Fred Albright. Fred was a grocer in a Dallas store and Dell a school teacher. However, Dell gave up teaching to raise Charles full time. To describe Dell Albright as an overprotective mother is being very charitable. She would change his clothes two or three times a day to keep the dirt off of him. She ruled by fear and paranoia. Afraid that he would contract polio, she wrongly lectured him not to touch dog feces. She also took him to the hospital to see how polio patients were treated. They had to be placed in a huge machine called an iron lung just so they could breathe. Dell kept goats so Charles could drink their milk, which she thought was healthier. She also spanked him if he didn't drink it. She would also tie him to his bed when he refused to take a nap as a way to force him to rest. These days, that's called child abuse. Dell insisted that he go to bed at 8 o'clock every night, even when he was in his teens. She fussed over him so much that he began to complain of headaches. 
still told him the headaches were from poor eyesight. And even though Charles had 20-20 vision, she insisted he wear glasses. On the surface, this could just seem like an overbearing mother. But the extreme control she exerted over Charles would impact him immensely as he got older. Dell was also very focused on making Charles successful. She would teach him extra lessons herself as a way to get him ahead in all of his classes. He learned so much that he was promoted two grades. When Charles was 11 years old, Dell caught him killing small animals. Killing animals at a young age for fun, as opposed to hunting with your dad, can be a red flag of a deeply disturbed child. It is one of three components of the homicidal triangle, which is made up of fire setting, bedwetting, and animal getting. And it is frequently seen in the childhood histories of adults who are later diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Of the three components, animal getting is the most serious and it is the most likely predictor of future bad acts. So what did Dell think about this? Was she upset? What was her solution? To enroll him in a taxidermy class. Taxidermy is the practice of preparing and mounting animal pelts and arranging them in poses. The class was conducted by mail order, So Dell took on the role of mentor and assistant. She explained to Charles what each of the various tools did and helped him skin his first bird. Charles became fascinated by taxidermy, practicing with the scalpels, knives, and even the little spoon used to scoop out the brains. He believed, as the course booklet said, that taxidermy was an art and he was determined to be a great artist. However, the one thing missing from all of his taxidermy art were the eyes. Fake glass eyes were very expensive, and Charles would spend hours at the local taxidermist store obsessively looking at them. But Dell would not pay for the fake eyes. Instead, she would sew little black buttons where the eyes should be, The birds appeared blind. They literally had no eyes. I think we all get the foreshadowing here, right? Even as a young child, Charles's behavior was impulsive and mischievous. He would constantly escape the yard. He would wait for people to pass by the fence and ask them to lift him over. Not knowing how to stop him, Dell tied him to the porch to keep him away from the fence. This type of behavior continued through middle and high school. He would steal blank report cards and fill them out with all A's for his parents. Once he set his chemistry teacher's dress on fire, supposedly by accident. At the age of 13, Charles was arrested for the first time for petty theft and aggravated assault. I can tell you that's very young for an assault charge. Despite this, Charles was well-liked and involved in school activities. He graduated from high school at the age of only 15 and went to college at North Texas University with the intention of becoming a doctor. He started with pre-med studies, but failed to complete those rigorous and demanding classes. In 1949, at the age of 16, Police caught Charles after he stole $380 from a cash register and discovered he had stolen two handguns and a very expensive rifle. He was sentenced to prison for theft and receiving stolen goods. Dell not only asked to represent her son as his lawyer, but after Charles was convicted, she offered to serve his sentence for him. Nevertheless, he ended up serving only six months of a two-year term. In 1951, Charles enrolled in the Arkansas State Teachers College. 
He was back to his old tricks, though, and broke into his professor's office and stole a test while the teacher was teaching in the very next room. He was popular with his classmates and was notorious for pulling pranks on his friends. It was at this college that he met his first wife, Betty, who he eventually married and with whom he had one child. Before Charles could graduate, he stole equipment from the college. They did not press charges, but Charles was expelled and did not graduate. After this, Charles worked a series of odd jobs, but could not seem to keep a job for more than a few months. There is no debate that Charles was a bright young man, but he couldn't seem to stick with anything long enough to become successful at it. Knowing that he eventually became a very bent and twisted serial killer, I think it's probable he had trouble, and I mean a lot of trouble, concentrating. Perhaps because his obsessions took up most of the room in his brain. Charles was arrested again in 1961 for receiving and concealing stolen goods, but the charges did not stick. In 1968, Three years after separating from his wife, Charles finally landed a job that was consistent employment as a biology teacher at a local high school. He was a very popular teacher and seemed to have finally found a job he could hold on to for more than a couple of months. But that ended in 1970, when the high school discovered he forged his bachelor and master's degrees in biology and that he did not even graduate from college. He was given three years of probation for fraud. Between the years 1971 to 1979, Charles was given probation several more times for various frauds and thefts. But after stealing an expensive piece of equipment from a hardware store, he served close to two years in prison. And while there, his mother, Dell, died. After being released from prison, Charles became very active in the Catholic Church, and he befriended a family who attended church with him. That family later accused him of molesting their nine-year-old daughter. And on March 23, 1985, he was convicted for aggravated sexual assault on a child under the age of 14. He pled guilty, but maintained his innocence, saying that he did not want the publicity for the trial. And despite the fact that he was already a convicted felon, he was only given 10 years probation. That is inexcusable. As far as we know, that was his first crime of interpersonal violence. Despite his extensive rap sheet, Charles was known to be a mild-mannered guy who was always buying people gifts. A longtime friend of Charles and a teammate on his softball team said that, and I quote, if somebody came after Charlie, he would back down as if he was scared. He literally could not stand the idea of fighting. He would rather give you a present. But there was one incident that many on his softball team remembered and told to the detectives and the press. One time after a game, the team was sitting outside when two women drove by in a car, staring at the men and flirting with them. One of the men on the team joked that they looked like they were sex workers and shouted out, and I quote, "'Hey, Charlie, you're single. Why don't you take after them whores?' Charles was furious. He responded, Hell, I'd kill them if I could, and then stormed off to his car and left. His friends were stunned. It was the first time anyone on the softball team had ever seen him mad. At the next practice, the teammates tried to apologize. He told them it was a touchy subject with him because his mother was, quote, a prostitute. Now, from what we know, this is not true. We can assume that he was not speaking about Dell, but that he meant his biological mother. When Charles was released from prison, he had searched for and found his birth mother in Wichita, Kansas, 
where she was a nurse. They became very close, and Charles even introduced her to his daughter. They had a very close relationship until the day she passed away. After Charles's father died in 1986, he inherited around $100,000 and some real estate. He blew through the money very quickly. He was a regular customer to the female sex workers in the area where he lived, and he became friends with some of them, lending them money and sometimes just taking them to a meal and talking without having sex. He was even a co-signer on murder victim number two, Susan Peterson's bail bonds and an emergency contact. But after the death of his parents, some of the women that he frequented noticed a change in his demeanor. He would beg some of the other women to spank him, and with others, he became increasingly aggressive. According to one woman who was hired by Charles as part of a double date, He tied them both to a bed and beat them with a belt and extension cord and yelled at them, Scream, bitch! You know you like it! However, he was able to keep those behaviors away from his friends. In 1985, around the same time that he decided to move back into his family home, he met Dixie Allen. She moved in with Charles and supported them financially with her salary from a retail job and a monthly annuity check. Dixie, however, did not know of his frequent trips to Dallas's red light district. Charles was maintaining two separate lives, but they were soon to collide. In 1990, Charles told Dixie that he needed to take a part-time job delivering newspapers so that he could have more spending money. But the job was in the middle of the night. He would have to leave at 3 in the morning and would not be back until 6.15 a.m. He now had the perfect excuse to be gone in the middle of the night. And, not coincidentally, the murders began only two months later. For Charles to begin killing at the age of 57, makes him a bit of an outlier. Most serial killers begin at a younger age. In an article in Rolling Stone magazine, criminal justice expert Peter Vronsky said that during his study of serial killers, which began in 1979, he has observed that, and I quote, serial killers generally develop the personality and compulsion befitting a killer when they're young. By the time they're 14, they're basically fully formed. They generally start killing in their late 20s. While it is possible that he could have murdered someone that we do not know about, this is not the only thing that sets Charles apart from other killers. There was a ritual to his crime, and he left a signature. Charles's signature was enucleation, which means the removal of the eyeball while still preserving the eye muscles and remaining orbital contents. Basically, he took out their eyeballs without destroying their eye sockets. In the early 80s, the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit began studying serial sexual murders to help in the construction of profiles of unidentified offenders. They differentiated an offender's conscious technique of committing a crime entering through a window, using a gun he brought with him, etc., from the repetitive behavior, such as surgically removing the eyes from a dead victim, which are practices that are unnecessary for the successful completion of the crime. The repetitive behaviors are consistent throughout the crimes and are driven by the offender's fantasies. These signature behaviors are unique. They become the murderer's calling card, in a sense, and can be used to track and link their crimes. These types of murders are planned well in advance. These killers have fairly organized minds, and they are not severely mentally ill. The victims of ritualistic killers are not so much actual people to them as they are a prop 
to live out their fantasy. Conversely, serial sexual offenders who act impulsively with little planning often do not engage in ritualistic or signature behavior because of the undifferentiated nature of their fantasy lives. All of the FBI profilers who were a part of this study are careful to point out that there is a distinction between ritual behavior and signature behavior. Rituals may evolve and change over time, whereas the signature, or theme, does not. Charles Albright is a ritualistic serial killer who also left his signature. Even though Charles denied killing the women and stealing their eyes, he loved to express his appreciation of that particular body part. He did not try to hide it. In fact, when his attorney introduced him to his wife during court, the first thing Charles told her was, you have beautiful eyes. When the news of Charles Albright's arrest hit the media, law enforcement officials in the greater Dallas area dug through their cold case files. Detectives believe Charles was responsible for the death of another Dallas sex worker in 1988 and possibly two others in Arkansas. By June of 1991, prosecutors charged Charles with the murders of the four Dallas women. But days before the start of Albright's trial in November of 91, prosecutors dropped three of the four counts of murder. They only had enough evidence to move forward with the case of the third victim, Shirley Williams. Body hairs from a blanket found in Charles' truck produced the strongest match in Shirley's slaying. But the crucial piece of evidence came when a sex worker that Charles had a standing appointment with took them to a field where he would take her to have sex. There, they found Shirley Williams' raincoat with Charles's hair on it. Much of the prosecution's case was based on circumstantial evidence and DNA from the hair found on the raincoat and blanket. DNA evidence at the time was controversial and not often used in court. The prosecution also had testimony from sex workers who claimed to have had sex with Charles and said he was prone to violence. Charles continued to deny that he ever picked up a sex worker or knew any of the women, but the prosecuting attorney submitted evidence that Charles was named on Peterson's emergency contact list at Ranger Bail Bonds. More evidence showed that Charles and Mary had known each other as neighbors in the years before she became a sex worker. Throughout the two-week trial, Dixie Allen stood by Charles. She refused to believe the gentle, generous man she loved was guilty of anything the police were accusing him of doing. Expert witnesses for the defense cast some doubt about the hairs and the fibers that were found on Williams and at Charles's home but the doubts they raised were not enough to sway the jury. On December 17, 1991, the jury of nine women and three men took four hours to deliberate and return a guilty verdict. Charles Albright was sentenced to life in prison at the John Montfort Psychiatric Prison Unit in Lubbock, Texas. He was 58 years old. Charles continued to proclaim his innocence, and there are still those who believe him. He was denied parole twice due to his criminal history and the thought that he still posed a threat to public safety. Although his parole was scheduled to be reviewed again in 2022, Charles Albright died in prison before then on August 20th, 2020. He was 87 years old. Next week on Killer Psyche, Mary Beth Tinning.
From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney. With research and editing assistance from Anne Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants. And the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. <laughs>